Well, good morning, First Baptist Church. It's so good to be able to join together via live stream in this worship time on Sunday morning at 1030. We're reminded even in that video uh, that we miss those days of being together in the room with all those different ages. We had that video from our multi-gen service uh, earlier, and it uh, was just a delight to be able to see those faces of children uh, and students and adults of all ages. And I trust that in your home right now, if you have multiple generations in your home, you're gathering for your own multi-gen service right now in your living room, dining room, kitchen, or wherever you're joining around this live stream. This is also a wonderful time to invite someone to church. You can uh, text someone right now and ask them to join you on the live stream, send them the link, uh, or you can uh, share this through your social media platform. Facebook allows you to do that, to share the stream through your own page and invite everyone that's uh, friends with you uh, to attend church with you. You can also find us on other social media platforms and other uh, streaming platforms, rather, uh, on uh, YouTube Live as well as uh, Amazon Fire Stick or uh, whatever you're using this morning. If you search First Baptist Church Jacksonville or FBC Jacksonville, you'll find us. We want to prepare our hearts to respond to what uh, the Lord has done in our lives. And so we're going to read this morning from Philippians 2. So please uh, follow along as I read Philippians 2 verses 5 through 11 as we prepare our hearts to worship Him. Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you having read the Scripture, recognizing that you have called us to an attitude that is alien to us, it's foreign to us. We do not know how to have the attitude of Christ if we don't have Christ. And yet in His example, we see what we're supposed to be like. We're supposed to defer. We're supposed to humble ourselves. We're supposed to think more highly of others. This is the very example Christ gave us, but He didn't just give us the example. He gave us the power through the gospel to do that. He gave us the power through His own shed blood to be forgiven for our arrogance and our pride and our self-centeredness. And He gave us the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the efficacy of His shed blood to overcome sin. Sin no longer has dominion over us. And so this morning as we worship, we want to be reminded of what you're calling us to be by gazing upon the beauty of Jesus Christ. And while we recognize that we've fallen short of what we should be, if we are in Christ, we're not what we once were. And we're not what we would be today were it not for the interruption of that path, that hell-bound path by the grace of God and the beauty of Jesus Christ. So now as we worship, let our hearts be right before you. Let our minds think the right thoughts and our heart love the right things as we worship and delight in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Would you join me in singing there at home as we rejoice in the powerful name of Jesus, the risen one.
stand amazed in the presence? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned What a Savior he is, church. Hallelujah, what a Savior. I love at the end of that where we get to sing, then he'll come. 
and we'll sing this song again. We'll sing this song in his presence. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a friend. Well, until that day comes, I think we feel in these days more than ever before our need for Jesus. And as we've sung of his glorious name, as we've sung of what a Savior he is and all that he's given us, we are recognizing that everything that we need is in him. And the words of this next song give a chance for us to verbalize how much, in particular in this season, but how much in every season we need him.
God, how we need you. As we continue with our scripture reading, church, please read along at home as Stuart comes to lead us here. Yes, please join me as we read from God's word found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Lord, please add your blessing to the reading of your word today, wherever we are in this world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, let me welcome you, First Baptist Church, to our streaming service. Uh, we are doing ministry in an extraordinary time. And as we come together to this season and this time in our service, I do want to encourage you that as a church, uh, we are continuing to do ministry together. We are continuing to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. We're continuing to hold services. We're continuing to reach people in the name of Jesus for the purpose of ministry. And because we are still doing ministry, that means we still need your financial investment. And so just as every week we take time in our worship to worship the Lord through giving, uh, we're taking time this week to worship the Lord through giving. And I want to ask you to continue to remember what we're doing, to continue to fund what we're doing, to continue to do that generously, even though we have to do it in unusual ways. Uh, we have established several different ways for you to uh, to give to our ministry. The first is to go to fbcjacks.com slash give. The next is to text give FBC Jacks to 34444, or you can mail your gift to 124 West Ashley Street, Jacksonville, Florida, 32202. That work is important. That worship is important. And the text that Stuart just read reminds us of why it is important. Jesus Christ sets an example for us, and he purchases our ability to give as he, though he was rich, becomes poor for our sake so that we could have everything in him. And so as we remember the work of Jesus and as we pray to worship Jesus and as we pray to give to the ministry of Jesus, let's go to the Lord together now in prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful for Jesus. We're thankful that he gave everything for us. We're thankful that you give us the opportunity to respond to that with giving of our own. Father, I pray for the people in our church who need ministry. I pray that as a church, we would come alongside them and help them, draw near to them and meet their needs wherever we can. And Father, I pray for people in our church who can provide for ministry. I pray that you would place in our hearts to give generously as you've given us ability and to give generously because Jesus gave so much for us. Father, thank you for First Baptist Church. Thank you for this body of believers so committed to Jesus. And I pray that in these extraordinary times, our commitment to Jesus would grow. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. That day is coming When wrong will be made right and justice will shine like the sun that day is coming when righteousness will reign and darkness will be chained for good so we watch and wait for that day
mercy flow and all the wounds we've known are healed that day is coming when his glory is unleashed and the promise we believed will see so Well, I want you to think about March 8th. It was just a few weeks ago, but a lot has changed since March 8th. March 8th was the last day we were together in a normal way before the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, and so much has changed in our lives, so much has changed in our homes, so much has changed in our church just in those few weeks uh, that it can be a little bit hard to get your bearings on what it was actually like uh, when we were doing things the way we used to do them. So much has changed about the way we have structured ourselves as a church that it is important to remember that there are things about First Baptist Church that haven't changed and will never change because they're not based on a virus, they're not based on a pandemic, they're not based on a quarantine, they're based on our commitments to Jesus Christ and His Word. One of the things that hasn't changed at First Baptist Church is that we are totally committed to the Bible. 
And every week, uh, the most common way that we make that total commitment to the Bible known, the way we manifest it, is by preaching through books of the Bible. Right now, we are preaching through the book of Matthew, and this week we come to Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29. We've taken some breaks from Matthew uh, in the fall and in the spring because of some remarkable transition that is happening in the life of our church apart from COVID-19. But we are preaching through the book of Matthew and we're preaching today on Matthew chapter 7 verses 15 to 29. It's the very last sermon we'll spend in the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus's most famous sermon, and it is a sermon about Christian discipleship. It's a sermon about what it means to grow in Jesus. It's about what it means to follow Jesus. The sermon begins with the Beatitudes and how you enter into the Christian life. It's fitting That here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29, Jesus ends with how you can tell whether you are living the Christian life, how you can tell whether you are in Christ. And as we come to Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29, and as we hear Jesus' final words in the Sermon on the Mount, this is what God says. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you'll know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Let's pray. Father, I want to ask for your grace that as we come together around your word, as your people gathered together across your world and across your city of Jacksonville, Father, I want to pray that we would be astounded at the words of Jesus. I want to pray that we would be amazed at the authority of Jesus. And I pray that you would overcome my limitations as a communicator. I want to pray that you would overcome the barriers of the internet and the distraction of the living room. And that Jesus' words would settle into our hearts and make us different. And Father, I want to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I said that a number of things had changed since March 8th in our church. A number of things have changed about the way our world and our country is responding to COVID-19, the virus, the illness caused by the coronavirus. One of the things that I have noticed that is different is early in March, we were given advice not to go out and buy masks. Don't go out and buy masks when you're out on the street. Don't go out and get masks when you're in the store because uh, we need those masks for medical workers, which is still the case. Uh, But you can't can't use the mask anyway to prevent against the virus. It's not going to help you. 
And now, uh, just a matter of weeks later, one of the things that we hear all the time is you really need a mask when you go out. You ought to have a mask. You can even make your own mask. That is a change from when this whole thing started to right now today. The question is why? Well, uh, the answer is that the leading experts now are talking about the fact that there is a massive amount of asymptomatic infection. That is, there are massive numbers of people who have the coronavirus but aren't showing symptoms, and so they're out roaming around infecting people. Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, said even just this past week that he thinks the number of asymptomatic people could be as high as 25 to 50 percent, which means we're interacting with people all the time who could have the virus and don't know it, and we don't know it. The lesson about our life that we're living is that things are not always what they seem. Things can look one way and be very different in reality. That's true with the coronavirus and it's true in church. It's true with Christians. With Christians, with people in the church, with people who claim the name of Christ, things are not always what they seem. In fact, One of the most painful and bitter realities that we must consider as we look at Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29, is that more people claim to be Christians than the number of people who are actually following Christ. There are fewer people who claim to follow Christ than are actually following him. That means in our fellowship, in our midst, with people that we would recognize as believers, with people who claim to be believers, not all of those are actually believers. And the crucial question that each one of us has to answer is how do we know that when we claim the name of Christ, that we are actually Christians. This is a message today for you. This is a message today for me. The temptation when you hear things like what I just said is for your mind to immediately switch to people that you think might not be real Christians. You are aware of things that you've seen in their life or things that uh, others have told you that they saw in their life and you think, well, that person isn't really a Christian. But this sermon is not for them. This sermon is for you. You see, you're not going to have to weigh the consequences for eternity of somebody else's confusion. You are not going to have to struggle for all eternity with the consequences of someone else's false profession, but you will have to endure the consequences of your potentially false profession. And so if it's true that more people claim Christ than actually know Christ, how do you know that you are one of the people who claim to know Christ and actually do? Well, I think Jesus in his words here give us three realities to help us discern whether we are real Christians. And I want to look at those briefly with you this morning. Three realities to help us discern whether we are truly in Christ, whether we are a real disciple of Jesus, or whether we are confused. And here is the first reality. You must know that the great risk for a true disciple is hypocrisy. The great risk, the great threat to you and to me, for anyone who would claim to be a Christian, the great risk is hypocrisy. One of the true and terrible realities of life is hypocrisy. That is, the putting on of a show, the wearing of a mask. Involving ourselves in pretense. People like to mask their sins and they like to magnify their strengths. That's true in every area of life. That's not just true for Christians. 
Sometimes uh, in certain circles, people talk about Christians as the only ones who are candidates for hypocrisy. But hypocrisy happens everywhere because every single human being alive loves to mask their sins and magnify their strengths. We don't like people to know our weaknesses and our frailties and the areas we mess up, but we're happy for them to know all the things that are beautiful and wonderful and lovely about it. That's why Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and social media all look the way they look. Hypocrisy is a problem in all of life, but it is a particularly painful reality in the church. Hypocrisy happens in the church and Jesus identifies it. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He says in verse 21 that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are people in our midst, there are people at First Baptist Church who look like sheep, but inwardly they are wolves. Their appearance of being a sheep is just a costume, it's not real. There are people in our midst who say, Lord, Lord, and Jesus does not know them. Jesus has no relationship with them. Hypocrisy is a problem everywhere, but it's a particular problem in the church. And it's a particular problem in the church because hypocrisy is so very deadly. That's one of the most important messages of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 is that this hypocrisy, this putting on of a mask, this pretending to be something other than what you are, it is deadly. Hypocrisy is damaging to other people. This is the point of verse 15. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. These are hungry wolves. There are people in our church who look like our friends. They look like they are Christians. They look innocent and peaceable, but that peaceable mask covers up someone who is ravenous. They desire to devour you. They desire to devour me. And just because they look nice, just because they look pleasant, just because they play the part doesn't mean that you won't lose your life over these people. Hypocrisy is deadly to you and me. Hypocrites damage others, but hypocrites also damage themselves. The, the deadliness of a hypocrite is not found only in what they do to other people. It's found in what they do to themselves. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 19, talking about a hypocrite, talking about the wolf in sheep's clothing, it says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Hypocrites might make it in life. Their, their sheep's costume, their mask might work to fool other people in this life. But from the perspective of eternity, every hypocrite dies. It dies forever. So hypocrisy is very deadly, but it's even worse than that. Hypocrisy isn't just deadly. Hypocrisy is also deceptive. The deception of hypocrites fools other people. These sheep's costumes look good. They are persuasive. We see false believers. We see deadly people in our midst and we think they're okay. Because if a wolf ran in and started eating everybody immediately, the ruse wouldn't work. And so the costume has to be effective. It has to be deceptive. And the deception hurts true disciples of Jesus. But hypocrites also deceive themselves. Hypocrites are also self-deceived. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Jesus looks at the hypocrite. He looks at the wolf in sheep's clothing. 
And he says, many will say to me, many will say to me, on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? This is a hypocrite. And there's many of them and they are fooled. They thought as they went about their life in the church and as they went about professing Christ and as they went about doing their deeds in Jesus' name, they thought they were legit. They trick themselves. This sobers us up. It makes me say again, this sermon is not about your friend. It's not about your husband. It's not about your wife. It's not about the person you're in a Twitter war with. It's not about the person you're suspected of. This is about you because the person right now most at risk of being fooled is you. You're in danger because hypocrisy is so self-deceiving. In fact, the one with the least concern about hypocrisy right now this morning is the most likely to be infected with the deadly disease. And so Jesus is waking us up. He, he's letting you know now what the risks are before you're blinking in front of him in eternity and it's all over with the shouting. And so are you a real Christian or are you fooled? Well, the first thing you got to know is that the great risk for a true disciple is hypocrisy. You could be deceiving yourself right now and be on a trajectory for a Christless eternity, where you die forever. So you've got to know that the great risk of a true disciple is hypocrisy. But second, you must know that the great reality for a true disciple is growth. The great reality for a true disciple is growth in Christ. It's a little scary, quite frankly, to realize that Hypocrisy is so deadly and so deceptive, and we can even fool ourselves. And so we want to go, well, how do we know? If we have any humility at all, if we have any interest in eternal things at all, if we have any desire to please Christ at all, we've got to go, okay, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be fooled. So how do I know? Well, Jesus is so helpful here because true disciples, people who are walking with Christ are able to penetrate the deadly deception of hypocrisy. And the way we're able to have the fog of hypocrisy lift and penetrate it is with the light of truth and the reality of the growth of fruit. Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 verses 16 to 20 talks about the importance of growth. He's talking about wolves in sheep's clothing. And he says, beware of those folks. He says in verse 16, you'll know them by their fruits. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. He says to look at fruit. This is a biblical metaphor. It's a biblical picture for growth in Christ for living a holy and a godly life. It's passages like this that make it true that our church is committed to a multi-generational pursuit of godliness. We want everybody in our church who has professed Christ, regardless of their age, growing in Christ for a lifetime because growth, walking in grace, walking in holiness, following Jesus is ultimately what marks out the true disciple the true follower of Christ from the false one. And there's two markers of Christian growth that Jesus makes very clear in this text. And I want to talk with you about that here. What, what is the kind of growth that Jesus is looking for that separates you out from a person who doesn't really know Jesus? Well, the first thing we need to say is that true disciples grow by following Jesus not by being known for following Jesus. This is so important. True disciples grow by really following Jesus, not 
by having a reputation for following Jesus. Do you see? You could have a reputation for following Jesus and not really be following Jesus. I have a reputation for following Jesus. But my reputation does not make me a follower of Jesus. What matters is whether I am actually following Jesus. And the reason this distinction is so important is because an action can be good and not look good. And an action can be bad and look good. So the point is that an action can look good without actually being good. Jesus makes this so painfully clear in Matthew chapter 7. Bold professions of Jesus don't make you a true disciple of Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are people at First Baptist Church who lift their hands and call Jesus Lord, Lord, and they're not going to heaven. I am speaking to you right now in what we call the LMA or the Lindsay Memorial Auditorium, which was ground zero of the miracle of downtown Jacksonville. Thousands of people streamed down these aisles back in the day and gave themselves to Jesus Christ. And they said, Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. And Jesus Christ says to some of those people, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord is going to heaven. Because an action can look good and not be good. With that bold profession, there needs to be some action. He goes on in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So you can't just have a bold profession. You got to have some bold action. But here's the real killer. Bold actions don't make a true disciple of Jesus either. This is verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Jesus, it's not just that I called you Lord, Lord, look at all the stuff I did. Did big things speaking in your name. Cast out demons, did miracles. These are big things. Anybody would look at these people and go, that's a Christian. They were a deacon. They distributed communion. They dunked people in the baptistry. They taught a Sunday school. Look, can't you see the work they did? And Jesus says, "Um, yeah. You did some things for me. But I, verse 23, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You got to see this. This is one of the most important things you'll ever think about in your life. People who do good things for Jesus, they speak for Jesus, they heal in Jesus' name, they cast out demons in Jesus' name, and Jesus looks at them at the last day and says, that work was lawlessness. What you did was disobedient. Because a work can look good and not be good. You can do the right thing in the wrong way, for the wrong reasons. This is what Jesus was talking about earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward in heaven. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason and in the wrong way, and it will be worthless. Jesus is saying to you, be careful. Be very, very careful. Because false disciples speak about Jesus. And they do things in Jesus' name. But Jesus doesn't know them. He has no relationship with them. 
I never knew you, he says. True disciples grow by following Jesus, not by having a reputation for it with their bold professions and their bold actions. Here's another marker of real growth. True disciples grow by following Jesus in times of difficulty. One of the things that God uses to separate the wheat from the chaff, the bad fruit from the good fruit, is times of difficulty. He uses seasons of trouble and travail to see who are his true followers. Are you following Jesus because Jesus is the head of the gravy train? Or are you following Jesus because you love him and want to serve him no matter what? False disciples follow Jesus and give up when times are hard. He says in verses 26 and 27, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So you you hear Jesus' words, but you don't grow. There's no spiritual depth. You don't grow in Jesus. And you're a foolish man. And how do you know? Because trouble comes. Verse 27. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house. And it fell and great was its fall. You didn't hear Jesus and follow him for real. You weren't really growing. You might have been doing some good things to be seen by other people. But when the trouble came, you fall and you fall hard. But true disciples are marked by faithfulness in the hard times. Verses 24 and 25, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, who grows, who really follows me, who's faithful when no one's looking, he may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And how do you tell? Because the trouble comes. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The trouble can't tear down a true disciple. And so a person, you, can look faithful and not be faithful. A true disciple of Jesus is marked by hidden faithfulness. And is marked by faithfulness in the hard times. We're in a hard time right now. As a church, as a community, your family. I was just talking with some folks this morning. All the novelty of the quarantine is wearing thin. And times are hard. Times are difficult. People are sick and alone and afraid and broke. The rains are falling. The winds are slamming against your house. And Jesus right now is separating true from false disciples. I want to encourage you. I've said nearly every week, I've encouraged something like a Corona project. What what is something that you want to be true in your life, in your heart, in your family, on the other side of this Corona quarantine than it was at the beginning? You don't need to be able to go to any restaurant you want or to come and sit in this room to grow in Jesus Christ. The reality is, is the increased isolation and the irregularity of our life is leading more people to sin privately and silently than they were before. You don't have to do that. When the wind beats against your house, you can listen to Jesus and grow. I want to encourage you this week to reach out to somebody to help you. I want to encourage you this week. I want to encourage you today to text someone and say, hey, I want to, I want to talk with you. I want to pray with you. I want to confess sin to you. I don't want to just listen to Jesus' words. I want to grow. This can be a time of real growth when it's quiet and nobody's looking and when it's hard and it's easiest to fall away. Jesus wants you to grow. You got to know that the great risk for a true disciple is hypocrisy. You got to know that the great reality for a true disciple is growth. And finally, you need to know that the great reward for a true disciple is Jesus. The great reward for a true disciple is Jesus. 
we actually see in Matthew chapter 7 a remarkable portrait of what heaven really is about. Did you see it? This is talking about the last day. It's talking about entering the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about dwelling forever in heaven in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. In, in verse 25, it's talking about not falling, but being founded on the rock. And there's a wonderful reference in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, about what heaven really is all about. And do you see what it is? It's Jesus. When you die and you appear in eternity, you appear in front of Jesus. And you give an account to Jesus. And Jesus has questions for you. And you have a confession for Jesus that is with respect to Jesus. Jesus, look what I said about you. Look what I did for you. And Jesus talks about a conversation that sooner or later every single one of us is going to have with Jesus Christ. Whether you believe in him or not, you're going to come face to face with this man. And he's going to have questions for you. And then he says to the people who are in trouble, I will declare to them, I never knew you. He's saying what the Christian life is about is less what you profess and less what you do. Those things are important in their own way, but you can do the right thing in the wrong way, remember? The Christian life is less about what you profess and less about what you do and more about who you know. Jesus Christ is saying this whole thing is about whether you have a relationship with me, whether I know you and you know me. And since I don't know you, hypocrite, since you spent your life doing the right thing in the wrong way, get out of here. We don't have anything to do with one another. Your life was not about a relationship with me, and so that's not going to be eternally true either. That's the bad news. But the good news is that for the true disciple, heaven is about encountering Jesus and seeing the one we have loved and the one we get to love forever. And Jesus will not say to the true follower of Jesus, get out of here. He's going to say, come to me. Just as, he, just as his invitation is, come to me, all who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will say that forever and ever and ever at the last day when we appear before him and we've been really trusting in him. This is a glorious statement that the reward you and I are looking for is Jesus. The arms we want to be wrapped up in is Jesus. The face we want to see and see forever is Jesus. There's going to be other good things about heaven, but those other good things aren't what make it heaven. What makes it heaven is that Jesus is there and he welcomes us in. But you got to be really careful. The reward is great and the reward is Jesus. But you got to be careful that you don't hear what I'm saying as the way you get to Jesus is by your spiritual growth. Just grow apart from grace and then you'll see Jesus. The biblical message is not that you can grow without grace and get the reward. The biblical message is that it takes the grace of Jesus to grow in Jesus. And we see this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 19, with the whole analogy of the tree and the fruit. Good trees lead to good fruit. Bad trees lead to bad fruit. It's impossible for a good tree ultimately to give you bad fruit. And it's impossible ultimately for a bad tree to give you good fruit. Those things don't happen. The analogy is the analogy about you and me and our hearts and our actions. As the root system of a tree is to its fruit, so is your heart to your behavior. The kind of tree stands for the kind of heart. And the kind of fruit stands for the kind of behavior. 
What Jesus is saying when you take away the analogy is that a person with a good heart will do good things. And a person with a bad heart will do bad things. And you can't have a bad heart and do good things, and you can't have a good heart and do bad things. And that's a real problem for you and me. Because our hearts are bad. We are sinners. We don't do what God wants us to do. In fact, the only kind of good work we know how to do is the kind of work that doesn't count. That's the right thing in the wrong way. We do, th- we do good things to be seen. We're wolves walking around and we zip up our sheep costume to try to trick everybody. The Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sins. And we are bad trees. And so we're going to produce bad fruit right up until the last day when Jesus sends us away. That's the truth. But the good news of being a Christian, the good news of following Jesus is that Jesus changes hearts. Jesus changes bad trees into good trees. This is talked about in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 14 to 18. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart And on their mind, I will write them. And he then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. What the author of Hebrews is talking about there is a heart transplant. He's talking about a tree transplant. He's talking about the work of Jesus to uproot the bad tree of your life and throw it away and replace it with a good tree. He's talking about the work of Jesus to come and live a perfect life and die on the cross and rise from the grave. And when you look to that work and you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus, Jesus Christ himself writes his law on your heart. You have a new and a different heart as soon as you trust Jesus. And now a good heart that Jesus has given you will produce good fruit forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And so it's not up to you. It's up to Jesus. If Jesus has really written his word on your heart, if he's really given you a true heart, then you can't be a wolf in sheep's clothing. But you're a good tree. You will produce good fruit. And one day, your eyes will close in this life, and they'll open in the next. And Jesus will see somebody he knows. And he'll tell us to enter into his rest. And we will run forever into the arms of the Jesus we know, into the arms of the Jesus we love, into the arms of the Jesus who has saved us, in the arms of the Jesus who's given us every good fruit we ever produced because he gave us the good tree to start with, because he changed our hearts when we believed and will know him and love him and be with him forever. It's the remarkable joy of a true disciple. I wanna thank you for being with us today at First Baptist Church. It's hard to be together online and not together in one room, but we are thankful to be able to talk about the truth of God and to be able to talk about the grace of Jesus Christ. If you are watching this morning and you're concerned about being a hypocrite, if you are watching this morning and you know you've been a hypocrite, then we wanna give you an opportunity to respond. We wanna encourage you to connect with 
one of our pastors and members of our ministry team. We've got a number of ways for you to do that. You can email at askapastor at fbcjacks.com. You can text to 904-357-0135, or you can visit us online at fbcjacks.com slash connect. And if you reach out to us, uh, somebody from our church will get in touch with you. We want to talk with you. We want to pray with you. We want to point you to the real hope that you can have in Jesus when you repent of your sins and he gives you a new heart. So I want to encourage you to reach out to us in that way. Uh, I also want to encourage you to join us back here tonight. Uh, At six o'clock, we will have one of our pastors, our student pastor for middle school, Reverend Dan Elkins here to deliver the word uh, to us tonight. So you wanna be sure that you are a part of that. And on Wednesday at 6.30, we're having our ongoing series, Don't Waste Your Quarantine. And I'll be talking with some folks about how to pursue growth in your spiritual walk uh, as, uh, as you're sheltering in place. So you won't want to miss that. It'll be a natural overflow of what we've been talking about. Last week, we talked about reaching 904, reaching our area with the gospel of Jesus. And we gave you several practical encouragements to do that. Um, if, if you want more information about this, you can visit it at fbcjacks.com slash reach 904. Uh, we want everybody to encourage members of the medical community. This is something you would just do on your cell phone with yourself and with your family and a thank you video for them and how much you appreciate that. You can visit us at fbcjacks.com slash thank you and it'll give you instructions about how to upload that video. We also are, uh, have produced a design for door hangers so that you can go up to your uh, neighbor's house, the people in your street and hang a door uh, on their doorknob and invite them to our online streaming service. We've got um, uh, a uh, a, a format for that. What do you call it? A, what do you call it? A template. That's what it is. I'm running out of words here. We got a template for that online and that's online as well. We also are asking you to serve. So we want you to encourage, we want you to reach, we want you to serve. We've got a mask making project. Uh, and in fact, we got a great video for you to watch about this. So watch this for just a second and then we'll come back. Hi, my name is Jeannie Poon. I'm the Director of Volunteer Services at Baptist Health and Wilson Children's Hospital. I'm thrilled to hear that the people at First Baptist Church want to help us not only make masks for our team members, but also we are in need of masks for our patients. They're also helping us with some of our isolation gowns. If you're anything like me, you may have had projects that you started at home with all great intentions, but they've never come to completion. Well, now's the perfect time to clean out your craft closet. Bring in those elastics, bring in the snaps, bring in the grommet tools, bring in your extra scrap material, anything that you think would be helpful for making these masks and making these gowns, uh, it will be a big help. In our church, we've been talking about reaching all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus, and what a great way for folks to reach out where I spend so much of my days. So I'm just thrilled about the impactful way that I know that this project is going to be on the folks not only that work at Baptist, but all the families and all the visitors that come through those doors. Be praying. Pray over those supplies. Pray over who will be receiving them, whether they're team members, whether they're patients, the hands that will come through, the hands that are working on them, from our doctors, our nurses, our housekeepers, our front desk folks, and everyone in between. We covet your prayers and we're thankful for the community support. Thank you for sharing your time, your talent, and for reaching Jacksonville. Okay, so just to be clear, these are masks for the medical community and you do need to be able to sew uh, to make these masks. So if you can sew, uh, we really wanna ask you for your help to do this starting tomorrow, Monday, April the 20th, every Monday for the next several weeks, you'll be able to come downtown or at the Nocatee campus and pick up the supplies that you need and drop off any masks that you've made. Uh, And that'll be from 9.30 to 12.30 and uh, near the dining room downtown. It'll be from one to four at Nocatee. Okay. Uh, And then we're asking you to pray. We want you to pray for our city, our church, our medical community, and you can find specific prayer requests for this remarkable season in our city and church at fbcjacks.com slash reach 904. Listen, it's an unusual time, but it's an important time. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Bible and we're ministering in Jesus name. 
And so I want to encourage you to keep doing that. I want to encourage you to do that with your families. I want to encourage you to find somebody who can hold you accountable and help you grow during the corona uh, pandemic. And until we are together tonight at six, grace be with you all.